Uh, good morning, my fellow travelers on the path. I am no one special. I've just had the great privilege and the undeserved blessing uh, of having been the student of uh, uh, three great masters. Uh, my first teacher was Swami Ranganathananda of the Ramakrishna Mission. He was later its president. Uh, and I met uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama in the early 80s. And soon after, I had the great privilege of uh, meeting Guruji. And the great joy of my life was that uh, both uh, Swami Ranganathananda and His Holiness uh, became good friends, uh, as did Guruji and His Holiness. And uh, so the first lesson for me really was that we live in an inclusive world and there is this great opportunity and privilege that we have to learn from many masters, but we need to make one of them our own. And for me, it has been His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And uh, I met Guruji, well, I, as uh, the introduction mentioned, that uh, I was doing a television series uh, of interviews with a whole range and variety of people, many of them from the spiritual traditions. And it was these three masters, and uh, I think in Baba Amte, another iconic figure who those of you who are not in India may not be aware of, uh, who did amazing work with leprosy. These were the four people I felt out of a thousand that I must have uh, interviewed uh, who embodied the highest aspiration of our journeys. And that was that they walked their talk. Uh, they lived what they preached, and they lived what they taught. And I think that that was uh, the, 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 the great lesson that I kick-started, in a sense, my uh, still very tentative, uh, incomplete uh, spiritual journey. And uh, some years ago, uh, I said uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to His Holiness Dalai Lama, I said, you know, I've been a student for 35 years, but nothing is happening. And he said, well, what's the hurry? It takes eons of lifetimes. And that was really the most sort of empowering message. Uh, and certainly because both uh, His Holiness and um, um, uh, Guruji have uh, had specific practices and specific sadhanas that they engaged in. And I had the privilege and blessing of uh, meeting uh, Guruji about a year before he passed away. And, uh, and there he was, urged on with Abhijita, who has now become uh, a, a wonderful young lady from a little girl who used to uh, sort of fuss over him. And when I came to see him, and in a little corner of that wonderful sort of terrace where he held, holds his classes, here was Guruji engaging in sadhana. And so none of the certitude that we have, we have arrived because we have become teachers was the great lesson. And that the sadhana unfolds through eons of lifetimes. And I come from a tradition where uh, we believe uh, that enlightenment doesn't mean that you opt out of the cycle of birth and rebirth, that you somehow merge into the larger energy, though there is that philosophical premise. I have the faith, I have the sense that uh, Guruji, whose life was so devoted to service and to helping other people, that somewhere he is going to come back, he's going to reincarnate voluntarily, even though he reached the level of moksha. He is going to reincarnate out of his deep and passionate commitment uh, to teaching uh, humanity in, in different incarnations, whatever that form might be. Because the motivation that he embodied was so strong and powerful uh, that I, I cannot see it uh, not manifesting himself. So I met Guruji and I was you know, told to talk about um, my experience and uh, my very incomplete, I'm not a scholar, uh, I'm, 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 I'm a filmmaker by training and uh, a spiritual uh, aspirant. Uh, largely because I feel I have uh, so much in my life to sort out. Uh, so I am, I, I'm, I'm just a, a, a humble student 
uh, and, I, and I see Prashanji and I see Gita Ji and I see Dr. Atreya sitting here, you know, great scholar, great practitioners. And my wife said to me, you must be crazy that you're going to go there and try and talk about your journey and your understanding of yoga in front of these great icons. So please forgive me, uh, you know, if I, if I stray uh, from what is correct and, and accurate and according to the scriptures, I really speak uh, from my own experience. And I think that uh, the, 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 the great quality that uh, you know, these great teachers have embodied is that they, uh, as I mentioned, uh, lived and articulated their experience and it wasn't really the scriptures. And in a sense, it was the scripture uh, and, and the experience that tended to cross-fertilize and validate it. Uh, so I, I was doing this program and um, I met Guruji and uh, I was deeply moved and I was struggling uh, with myself. And uh, so he said, uh, well, come to Pune. And uh, I had a problem with, with my digestive tract and nobody could figure out what it was. And that was uh, an error before uh, you had uh, uh, CT scans and MRI machines and they just had a, a, a horrible experience called a barium enema, uh, which had shown that my uh, kidneys were inverted, that my um, uh, transverse colon was shorter than it should have been, and the ascending colon folded over the descending colon. And uh, so I had a troubled mind, uh, a troubled, restless mind. Uh, I came and I spent two weeks uh, in Pune, uh, introduced uh, by uh, Guruji to very, very basic postures, very, very basic uh, uh, techniques. And, uh, and, and then the great learning at, at that time was, uh, when I look back, uh, in, 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 in what that experience did for me uh, was that I, as, as I continued those practices, uh, there was a, uh, a release, in a sense, of what my physiology uh, had assimilated and held back. And it turned out, we learned later, that my mother, when she was expecting me, uh, lost her mother in a train accident. And so it was a malrotation of the fetus because of the trauma she went through, which was then transmitted to me when I came into, uh, and, and then I sort of screamed my way into life and living. Um, uh, and it was the, the, the healing happened because those sensations and memories from the womb and the feeling of being trapped became arose in my consciousness. So it wasn't purely a cause and effect in terms of, you know, doing something physiologically, uh, but really looking at what the imprints of my experience had left on my body and to bring that into awareness and then begin a process of healing. And that gave me an, in, uh, uh, an, an, an insight experientially uh, on the um, aspiration uh, of yoga and the aspirations of uh, Guruji's teachings. I will come back a little more, uh, a little further uh, to my, what I'm sure is an incomplete understanding uh, of, um, of, of Patanjali and, and Guruji's yoga, but just to complete the narrative of my uh, very privileged uh, association with uh, Guruji. And uh, so the years went by, I interviewed him on two or three occasions and he kept, uh, kept asking me as to how I was doing and I said, you know, okay, I'm, you know, I survived. Uh, then with my work with His Holiness, uh, His Holiness was very keen that we start an initiative which some of you might be familiar with called the Mind Life uh, Conferences and, 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 and the series of engagements uh, between um, modern science and the contemplative traditions, uh, to see what we could learn from each other. We were not looking at Western medicine to validate traditional wisdom, but since the aspiration of uh, all uh, spiritual journeys and all philosophies is to understand the true nature of reality and to understand uh, uh, the, the human body and the human mind, and knowledge is evolving, and certainly the more empirical basis for knowledge evolves, that we should remain open to doing so. We were hugely surprised 
that nobody other than Guruji was willing to respond to this invitation. Because I think contemporary contemplatives were fearful that if they had to engage in a rigorous conversation or a rigorous dialogue about their philosophies, techniques and practices and put them under scrutiny of empirical experience, juxtaposed, needless to say, with subjective experience. But there is some element of an empir uh, empirical experience, as in my case, we discovered twenty-five years later when we had MRIs, there was this friend of mine at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences who had done the first barium meal, uh, barium meal enema. When we went back, of course the, the rotated kidney didn't move back, but the descending colon that had folded over the ascending colon had nudged back into place. So as the psychological, emotional aspect was addressed, or vice versa, the chicken and the egg, which comes first, we don't really know. But through posture uh, and asana, and the, the great genius of Guruji was his ability to direct for each individual practitioner consciousness to that particular point uh, in their physiology that held the imprint of consciousness. Let me try and uh, explain uh, this, this a, little, a little further uh, as we sort of understand it uh, from our tradition and I, I think that uh, uh, you know, Guruji uh, felt that that was not an unworthy uh, articulation of this. And, and that was really that our, uh, our experiences of everyday life and living and our personalities and our states of mind uh, are a function of karma and how does karma operate? Karma operates through our thought and we in Buddhism emphasize that uh, it is the intention behind an action that determines karma and not the action per se. This for example is a, is a sort of a, a, a variation of what uh, Gandhiji might say where the means were as important as the ends. So, for example, uh, to, 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 to tell a lie is not an absolute sin, it depends on the motivation with which we tell a lie. So the example we often use is that if there is a, there is a communal riot going on in India and I am harboring someone from a particular community and terrorists come in from the outside and want to know if I am harboring someone and I tell a lie. So the motivation uh, of my thought of telling a lie is pure. So in that context, that the, 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 the play of karma becomes the imprints on our consciousness and our mental diet, the thoughts that we either give ourselves consciously or happen spontaneous, spontaneously. And, and the play of that creates in every unfolding moment a new dynamic in our consciousness. And that dynamic of our consciousness manifests to start with, with our posture. So if I'm feeling depressed, this is very mundane, I know there are very advanced yoga practitioners here and, and who am I to tell you this, but so when you're depressed your body's like this, when you're happy you're like this. And so we know this relationship uh, between our posture, this is just a very gross level example, and what is the imprint on our consciousness. So it was the great genius of uh, Guruji that he invented, created really an infinite number of uh, asanas and postures. Because then you had the classic form, but in my own experience, each time you came to him, he tweaked it and in a sense created a new posture. And this also has resonances to help us understand this principle perhaps a little better is again uh, in, in, in the Buddhist tradition, we tend to, we work with deities and we use the word, we work with deities and people have often wondered, why do we have a million deities in India? So you have the classic archetypes, just like you have the archetypical uh, uh, yoga postures, but what a great teacher does is he tweaks them. So if you have say Ganesh, Lord Ganeshji, which we, is someone we're all familiar with, so a great teacher will tweak for his particular student, the Ganeshi image that he uses and works with. 
So in my case, for example, His Holiness felt that I was very reticent and not uh, assertive enough, so I began to work with a wrathful deity. So I visualized a wrathful deity so that I can try and imbibe aspects of their, uh, their personality, and then he would add maybe uh, a sword somewhere or another color somewhere so that it would respond to my specific psychosomatic needs. And that was the genius of uh, Guruji, uh, which he worked with, what we were working with, with, with the more sort of tantrianic, uh, tantric traditions, and please, tantric, tantric traditions are not just sexuality. Uh, Guruji was here doing with asanas and posture for every single student uh, that he engaged with personally. So it wasn't in, in, in the large canvas of uh, just saying individualizing yoga and, and, and saying, well, this particular asana is good for you. But within the archetype of the asana, he was doing modifications uh, by enabling people to direct their consciousness so the karmic imprints in their bodies were being released. And being released through effort and bringing to awareness now, we also know from modern psychiatric practice that one way, uh, often dangerous, if not uh, uh, adequately circumscribed uh, by a moral, moral framework, if not properly done, is through therapy to bring to awareness uh, things that happened uh, in our past and may have left uh, enduring uh, impressions on our consciousness. So it was really this, this, this amazing ability uh, that Guruji had. So we'll go back to this conversation uh, that we had uh, with, uh, with uh, the, the, the Dalai Lama and you know, Abhijata, and I don't know if, if Raya is here, I haven't seen him in a decade. I mean, the two of them performed these postures and uh, His Holiness would go and, and, and I, th I think it was, it, it, it was quite a harsh moment for uh, Abhijata because he would go and say, well, look, you know, her thigh is in position Y, and it, it shows that she's holding back on energy X. I'm not going to identify the, the energies he was talking about. She will blush. But so it was his, able to, his ability to analyze the individual from their postures and from the postures they were attempting to carry through. So here was a man who ostensibly uh, was talking about the external, externalities uh, of uh, uh, accessing uh, human consciousness, but was deeply grounded and, uh, and, and schooled in them. Uh, so, you know, the, 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 His Holiness and, and, and Angar became great friends, and, and uh, uh, you know, despite the divergence in, in philosophy in, in, and in Buddhism, uh, where the source of uh, dukkha, and I think both traditions use the word dukkha, uh, is craving. And in, uh, you know, in Patanjali, it has the, the relationship between, the connection between Purusha and, and Prakriti. Uh, but the, what, what, what emerged from that was that the intellectual vocabulary of a non-conceptual experience uh, is extremely challenging and difficult to articulate. It's virtually impossible. To give you a gross example, I mean, we all know that, you know, you know, this is water and we all know something is sweet because we have both tasted something sweet. But if we're looking at more subtle levels of experience, that it is impossible to know for sure that we are talking about the same thing. At the end of the conversation, Guruji said, well, you know, it's been 20 years and you haven't been to Pune. Come and spend a week uh, with me, uh, a week, a month for a year. And it's my sort of deep sort of regret that I allowed samsara to overwhelm me and I came for five or six months. And at, at that time, I was struggling with a restless mind. Uh, and I will not forget, he led me through postures which I never was able to see from the outside because he just took charge and said, Put your le you know, raise your leg, stand on your toes or whatever. He just directed me to do what I was doing. And then he would make me sit between his knees, sitting on the ground in front of him, uh, usually with a bandage around my eyes. And I learned that the practice of working backwards 
from trying to manage how, the, how much the eyes move, you begin to induce a state of quietude. He would then press little points on my head. Uh, I cannot give it a label, and it's always tempting to say it was bliss, it was light, it was X, Y, Z. They're all non-verbalizable, <laughs> I cannot put them in words, non-conceptual experiences, but they brought to surface for me uh, many of the experiences or insights that dovetailed with the primary tradition of my own practice from Buddhism. So here was a master, and we've had chants to the deities, uh, who was impacting the learning and the journey of someone from a completely different uh, tradition. And so, Swamiji was also deeply secular, secular in the sense of being inclusive, so that the techniques and practices that he taught and recommended and grew out of a particular philosophical tradition were accessible to all of us. And the fact that he was accessing it through the body has particular relevance and resonance because we are living in an age where we have begun to externalize reality. We all want to be judged by how we look, by the clothes that we wear, the cosmetic surgery that we've had carried out on ourselves. And so what was remarkable in his you know, look, if, if, you, if you read uh, uh, Patanjali, and I only partially understand Patanjali, uh, you know, Patanjali was giving the framework of a method. He was not detailing particular postures and the, and the effect that that posture would have on an individual. He left that to the great masters that followed to evolve those in keeping with the sensibilities and the culture of that period. And so here was this great master, and I often think that, uh, I mean, you know, we should be so privileged that, you know, thousands of years from now, or certainly hundreds of years, I, mean, I certainly will feel, you know, I, I just wonder that uh, it, it, what it must have felt like to have been around when, you know, the Buddha was there, or Patanjali himself, or Adi Shankara, or Jesus Christ that amongst these sort of two or three great masters of our times, we've had the privilege to share the planet with them. And not merely the yoga he taught or the yoga that the centers uh, that uh, follow his traditions practice today, but it is the underlying principles that he has set forth uh, into the universe uh, at this time in human history and has set forth um, uh, you know, amongst, uh, you know, yoga teachers of uh, all, all, all traditions. And as I said, so for him, uh, asana was not posture, uh, it was self-knowledge, a, a journey of uh, discovery. And, and those of you who have sent, spent time, uh, you know, at the ashram, and I would imagine most of you have, uh, just look at the incredible simplicity and austerity of the man. Look at how much he charged, only to enable the institution to function. How outer directed he was in terms of the, the philanthropic activities he did, his commitment to the environment, to people in his, his, his uh, you know, to, to reinvent uh, 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 the village uh, where, where he was born, his compassion. So behind that sternness, was a deep compassion. He was never stern with me because he probably thought I was, you know, sort of, you know, fragile and I would break down or something. Uh, he always used the, the sort of, how did, a calibrated uh, level of psychological pressure, which was devoid of ego. I've seen other, I mean, this is not to, I mean, not, not to make a generalization, but I, I, and when I said practice what he preached, not only in the manner that he lived his life, but I have watched, I have interviewed and met and been to the ashrams of so many teachers. How many yoga icons do you know of that stature, or who claim stature in sort of uh, the public space, who could even achieve the postures 
uh, that, they, uh, that they teach. They usually have young nubile assistants, you know, who look very attractive and beautiful. And so when, 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 my, when my, my doctor or my wife says, you know, talks about my midriff, I always point to Guruji's and I said, look, look at the amount of yoga he did and he was happy and healthy, leave me alone. I mean, it's… Th th there's a deep truth behind it because the obsession was not how to make the body beautiful, it was how to make the inner being beautiful. And then you would begin to radiate that aura that comes from inner beauty. And then the physiology wouldn't matter. So he was moving beyond using the body but enabling us to move far, far beyond the body. And, uh, you know, and, and my great sort of… Uh, I was going to say, you know, because I'm more familiar with the Indian language to say Guruji must be turning in his grave, but I'm sure he's in some subtle body waiting to manifest, to come back and teach and serve us all, as I said. Uh, that we, we, we're now trying to promote mass yoga. Uh, and selling yoga purely as an adjunct to physiological health. This is not to deny that it impacts physiological health. But that is not the aspiration of yoga. And so, I, what, what can I share? I mean, I'm a student and then there are, you know, a thousand yoga teachers here. Uh, what can I say to you? Uh, except that, uh, you know, as a student, if I am so inspired uh, and, and, and feel my life, uh, uh, you know, transformed with eons of lifetimes to come. Uh, and, and when I said this to, to… and I told His Holiness this, uh, I said, look, uh, if you had told me this before, I would not have embarked on this journey. And he said, well, that's why I didn't tell you. <laughs> and, 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 and this is really what Guruji is implicitly saying to us, that this is just a journey. If we have become teachers or we can get into all kinds, you know, sort of unique postures, doesn't somehow complete our journey and give us this sort of elevated position that we are now teachers and we are hence superior. Our journey is infinite and it continues. Ah. <laughs> I, you know, I keep struggling with, uh, <laughs> with myself. <laughs> Uh, I just say that, um, and I believe that uh, his uh, you know, Guruji uh, conquered uh, the final frontier uh, in this lifetime, uh, and he manifest uh, dharma, megha, samadhi, that he surrendered his sense of indi individuality uh, to the universal. Uh, I miss him terribly. Uh, I just. Uh, this is wonderful laughter, his smile, and his touch. I will never, ever forget, perhaps for lifetimes to come, the little points in my head that he touched to give me levels of experience that years and years of sadhana uh, had not produced. Uh, I think together uh, we, we celebrate uh, Guruji's birthday, and I just hope that I live long enough uh, to see a 20-year-old reincarnation uh, of Guruji uh, out in the world uh, teaching yoga for, for, for something else, but spreading wisdom and truth and who he was. Thank you very much. This has been a great, uh, uh, a great, 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 great blessing.